afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to, as Shruti said, the final panel session of this annual Sankalp Unconventional Summit. I hope you've all had a great time the last couple of days. If you have, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Good. So this session, as Shruti says, discusses, we're going to explore the relationship between India and Africa. And the objective, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, collaboration on social innovations between India and Africa. Are we moving in the right direction? And I just added a couple of lines there. I say, why now? Why not? Think about that. Why now? Why not? So if I can introduce my panel, I'm going to start on the far right. Andreas Zeller. He's uh, had a wealth of experience, worked for everyone from Citigroup to um, Credit Suisse. He's worked for IFC World Bank in DC, New York. And now he works for <coughs> Open Capital, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Andreas, welcome to the panel. Thanks, Jeff. You can give him a round of applause if you want. <laughs> OK. In advance. But no pressure. Thanks. No, and, and I think what we'll, each of us will do, I'll, I'll just give a very brief minute and a half on, on what we do in Kenya and East Africa, what brings me here to India, and then a few thoughts in terms of what we're working on very hard the last few days, which is convincing many of you, many of India's innovators, to come to East Africa. Uh, we started four years ago in Kenya with, with the idea of helping businesses reach the point of scale. And, and Dr. Zia Khan and el others this morning provided some, some light on that. We were frustrated that we found very high potential businesses and organizations that weren't actually scaling. And we decided to bring that level of operational rigor and management advice to help them do so. Uh, so we've seen now 89 different uh, growth stories that we've been able to help across nine countries in East and Southern Africa. And all that have focused on innovative products, high potential uh, growth stories that, uh, that have been impressive in their own right. But what's been very interesting to me personally and to our team uh, in the region is why not bring other innovations to East Africa? So many products, so many interesting services are being innovated in countries like India. Why not bring them? And, and don't do it in a naive way. Uh, we've seen so many failures from South Africa, from the US from Europe that have come to Africa without a local partner and failed promptly. Why not take some of those innovative products and services, bring them to East Africa, with partnership with organizations like Oscars, like others, and jointly innovate, jointly scale 10 times as quickly as you would otherwise, uh, be it a franchise model, be it a royalty model, be it an equity partnership, and bring those types of benefits to much broader groups of, of populace, and, and in doing so, uh, launch additional capital in the region. We work with 80 different investors now from around the world, all of whom are very strongly in support of this type of model. And really our mission in the last couple of days has been to, to find those innovators that we've all been highlighting and try and ask them, would you come to Africa? What, what would your model look like at scale in Africa? And then partner with them with many, partner them with many of the entrepreneurs that we support uh, in East and Southern Africa to try and see how together they can innovate and grow. And uh, we've already seen this in one specific case, and I'll spend about 30 seconds on, on that case and then stop, uh, which was in affordable housing. I think it's a good story because uh, this, this level of home was, was not available in the Kenyan market, where you have a demand for affordable housing in the hundreds of thousands now. Uh, and now, just only now and recently, there have been models innovating, trying to reach this very, very low home price. Now that isn't true at all in India, where for the last couple decades, uh, entrepreneurs have been innov innovating in this space. Uh, when we backed an entrepreneur with a, an innovative affordable housing model in Kenya, one of the key missing elements was how do you scale it? How do you get beyond one or 2,000 homes? How do you get to 100,000 homes? And the first investor we brought on was one of the most successful affordable housing experts in India, who's developed hundreds of thousands of homes across major metropolitan areas at a fraction of the cost that we were looking at in Kenya. This investor has been far from just capital. This investor has helped our client launch the first project and think much bigger than they would have otherwise. So my mission here in the last couple of days has been to speak with you and find how to bring more businesses over to that side and help you grow and raise capital. So I'll end with that and very much look forward to our discussion. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Andrews. 
Right next to Andreas is Sachin Rudra. When I asked him earlier on, I met him for the first time today, I said, oh, like Sachin Tendulkar? He says, yes, Tendulkar's named after me. <laughs> That's the kind of confidence he brings to the Acumen Fund. He's India director for Acumen and recently was <clears throat> made the global chief investment officer for Acumen, which means he's on a plane three out of four weeks in a month going out there doing what he does best. Sachin, what you got to say? Um, <clears throat> so my name is Sachin. I, um, you know, work at Acumen Fund. So I'm the boring guy on the panel, <laughs> you know, investor, always asking hard questions. <laughs> Uh, but Acumen actually invests in a number of geographies, and we do invest in both India and in Africa. We've got about 32 million invested in India and about just under 40 million invested in Africa between uh, two offices, one on the eastern coast in Nairobi and one on the western coast in um, Accra, in Ghana. So um, I think the first point is, um, you know, which uh, is... I think of businesses and I think of how they can move between economies. And the starting point of that is I've seen two kinds of things happen. One is the whole business model moves to the new economy. So we used to have a company called D-Light Designs. Uh, we still have it actually. Um, and it started in India. It's a solar powered lantern company. Um, from India, it actually <coughs> sells more lanterns in Africa than it does in India today. So it's clearly an example of something that was incubated, started, stabilized in India, but now does more of its business in Africa. Um, and there are a number of companies in our portfolio like that. There is a company which is actually moving the other way. It's a company called Sproxil. Uh, it started in Nigeria. And it does a very simple thing. It, uh, you know, it uh, attacks counterfeit medicines. So on your medicine strip, you read out a number, you put it into your mobile phone, you send an SMS, and then the manufacturer has a sort of database and they SMS back to you whether that particular strip of medicine was actually manufactured by the pharmaceutical company. Uh, they've started in Nigeria, very successful in Nigeria and Ghana, and they're actually entering India now. So that's the business model moving. I think it should and will move in both directions. The other plays, of course, being a supplier uh, to businesses in Africa, which also some of our enterprises like Husk Power Systems have started doing into various parts of Africa. But my learnings are threefold, and I'll just take you through them very, very quickly. Uh, there are consumers everywhere, and businesses will follow consumers. Uh, so if the same problem of uh, pure water exists in India and it exists in Africa, then you can actually expect businesses to follow consumers like Water Health International has done. However, consumers and markets are not the same everywhere. So just because you've got consumers with a similar issue in Africa, that's not a necessary condition for an Indian company to succeed in Africa. Um, and the last point, I think, which is, uh, you know, which is probably the most interesting, is if you don't have a strong base market, if you haven't built a successful business in India or in Africa, then saying that, you know, I'm not so good here, but I'll go and, you know, become really successful in Africa because competition is lower or regulation is easier is, um, is, is one of the sort of wrong reasons to try to go across to a different uh, country. Having a strong base and then moving is, I think, a much, much stronger reason uh, for moving and gives you a higher probability of success. Excellent. Thank you, Sachin Tenduka. I mean, <clears throat> Rudra. Right next to him, well done. Dr. Seema Bhatia Pantaki, she's an economic advisor for DFID. Lots of years she's worked in Ministry of Finance in the UK and was a, uh, she was seconded to Africa where she actually did her PhD based on her work there in a country called Malawi. A great story she tells us about that. We'll ask her later on. Dr. Seema, what do you have to say? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I've already learned three important lessons from Andreas and Sachin, so it's great to be here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what DFID is doing on India, uh, India's collaboration with uh, other low-income countries. Um, we live in a situation now where resources are scarce, they're getting scarcer, especially for development as aid declines. 
And it's extremely important, and the FID recognizes this, that we have to tap into every source available, be it private sector or be it public sector, to foster collaboration across regions, across countries. So I work in a very exciting team in uh, DFID in India. It's the Global Partnerships team. And what we do really is uh, share, celebrate, and facilitate this kind of collaboration. Now, we recognize that India is the hotspot for a lot of innovative ideas, be it technology or business models or products and services that have uh, proven um, their ability to have an impact on the bottom of the pyramid in India. And we also recognize that other countries uh, with similar problems may be able to tap into this. And this is what um, uh, we are looking to do largely through our portfolio. So I lead on uh, the global work under a program called INVENT, which some of you might have heard of over the last couple of days. Um, and what we're looking at is um, facilitating a partnership between Indian players and players in South Asia and in Africa to come together, uh, work together on innovative ideas around healthcare and the agriculture and food sector, uh, and see how things that have worked in India can be replicated and scaled uh, in uh, other countries so that they have a development impact. Now, I could be here all day and tell you about all the exciting work that I do, lots and lots of examples, but I don't want to take um, the shine away from Jet. <laughs> so I'm just going to take one more minute and tell you about Millennium Alliance. Uh, we had a session on it earlier, and Millennium Alliance is a great platform that brings together public sector and private sector resources. We are partners with the Technology Development Board, uh, uh, FICI, ICICA Foundation, ECO, uh, and USAID. And uh, what DFID has done, has, it's bought, bought its resources on the table, on this partnership, to do exactly this, to tap into, into the Indian market uh, for innovative activity and see how this can be replicated uh, and facilitated in um, African countries. Also, we look into South Asia in the future, but uh, in low-income settings to have a development impact. So my plea is, uh, we're in the middle of the second round of Millennium Alliance at the moment, but very soon, uh, probably mid-year, we'll be going into the third round where we'll be doing a lot more engagement on the global part um, of the Millennium Alliance offer. Please look at the website. Uh, if you have bright ideas around healthcare and food, please come and talk to us. Uh, we are extremely interested in solving poverty together uh, in a collaborative way, and the FID is very happy to facilitate this. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Seema. So we've all heard of Acumen, we've heard of DFID, we've all heard of Open Capital. In Africa, for the most part, none of us had heard of this thing, this company called IntelliCap up until very recently. And more so, IntelliCap coming to Africa and offering awards in social enterprise. It's incredible. I mean, it, it, literally, the, the, they've been put on the map and they're making a difference. So Anurag walks up to me at the last award show in February, and he, after the, I guess my performance or whatever it was, <laughs> he literally walked up to me and said, you're coming to Mumbai in April. I said, uh, you know, I gotta check my calendar. I'm a busy guy, Anurag, you know, I gotta talk to my agent who I have to talk to. So anyway, to cut a long story short, Anurag Agrawal, CEO, IntelliCap, you guys have put people like Dr. Agan on the map and many others. We're gonna be talking to him in a second, but you tell us why Africa, why now? So uh, at IntelliCap, uh, I thankfully, I hopefully don't need to introduce IntelliCap to this audience now since I've been talking quite a lot from the stage, but uh, at IntelliCap, we've been thinking of uh, Africa for quite a while now. Uh, I think at least two to three years. And, uh, and the, you know, the same argument always kept coming back. You know, India is such a large country, there's so much opportunity there, there's so much work to do here, so why Africa? And uh, the way we looked at it uh, was that, uh, you know, uh, our core focus is on trying to make, uh, take market-led approaches and trying to, you know, create development outcomes. And how do we create the maximum leverage with uh, what we have and with the resources that we have? And, and while, you know, we were organizing this forum last year, uh, we realized that uh, 
you know, there is a similar sort of uh, situation in Africa as well. There is a growing, uh, <laughs> growing momentum around social enterprise, and and there is no forum as such to bring all of the uh, various various ecosystem players together. And and we thought, you know, it's time for us and typical uh, IntelliCap style. Uh, you know, we 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 don't tend to overanalyze. We just uh, decide to go in and test the water. So we we decided. And we actually decided, announced the, that we'll be in Africa this year. So we went and tested the waters, and we were very, very encouraged with what we saw. In fact, uh, the feeling that I got when uh, you know, I spent uh, the time in Africa was that it, Africa, or let's say the East African region and Kenya in particular, was exactly where India, the, the discussions that we were having in India when we launched Sankalp here, was pretty much at a similar stage. And for us, that's a great opportunity. And uh, while we you know, did Sankalp, Africa and launched it uh, this year in February. We will be back again next year. But uh, what we have thought is that you know that by itself is not enough, and we need to take this entire ecosystem. Absolutely. So, so, so we are committed to taking the entire intellect app ecosystem of intellect, capital, and networks uh, to the African continent. We will start from East African region, and and then the plan is to spread across the nation across the continent, and uh, we would definitely want to partner with uh, people like uh, Open Capital, with DFID, and with uh, the entrepreneurs who are operating on the ground to build out the ecosystem. Nothing that, says, uh, that we can do uh, is going to make any difference if we are going it, uh, going it alone. So. And just to let you know, I will be available this time next year. Just, I'm throwing that out there, okay? <laughs> just in case, yeah. We'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Ecosystem, I like that word, very good, very good. So, at the first ever Africa Awards, there's a whole bunch of folks who were finalists from across Africa, by the way, and you know, IntelliCap flew them all to Nairobi, and the judges had a hard time picking the finalists and coming down to the wire, and the, the individual, the company that finally won the overall award is one known as Continental Renewable Energy, the CEO gentleman on my extreme left, Dr. Oscar Agan. He's been in this, he was incubating this and trying to put it together for seven years. And his company, once he did that, is not even a year old. It's actually gonna be a year old the end of this month. So he's literally, you know, come out of the gates flying and he just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Dr. Agan, correct me if I'm wrong. Very right, very right. <laughs> and if it wasn't for people like Intelica, let's face it, would you have been discovered? Would you have taken off the way you have? No, obviously, I've got to give credit to, to Intelica and the, and the Sankal Forum for availing us the opportunity to showcase what would be rotting somewhere in the corners of Kariobangi. And uh, really, to me, that, that forum was like God sent. You can imagine being on a starter block for seven years, and then all of a sudden, you burst to almost what you call a continental level, not just a national level. And uh, the fact that they gave us a platform that would link us to finances or investors, and the fact that they've given us a platform to link us to the market where we target to franchise is a key milestone in a period that is just about 11 months old into trade. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Sachin, tell me something, and you know, you, you work for an American company, but you're based in Nairobi. Um, Andreas, you're also based in Nairobi. But Sachin, let me ask you this. Why has it taken so long? I know you gave two good examples, solar lanterns, counterfeit medicine, but for the most part, why has it taken so long for for these two blocks to come together, if you will? I, I think, uh, Jeff, it's the, sort of the, it's the last thing which I mentioned, that you know, social enterprise in India, uh, I mean, two things. It's, it's relatively new, and it's taken an awfully long time for the companies that I spoke about to get their model right. Um, and the last point that I made was, uh, you know, the, the cleverer entrepreneurs and the cleverer funds uh, have realized that till you get your base market right, Till you're generating profitability and cash in your base market, expanding too quickly um, can, be, can be a dangerous thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, the consumers are similar. They do have similar problems. 
but there's regulation, uh, there is uh, you know, local dialects, there is the way you do marketing, there's customer adoption, all of those things, uh, there can be fundamental differences, and then there can be little differences which you don't even see till you find that your business expansion is floundering because people don't react quite the same way. Mm. Um, I think one of the things that should make it faster is because that actually happens in India even between the states within India mm -hmm. because languages are different, you know, uh, sort of social uh, acceptance of various kinds of products is different. So I think Indian firms are well positioned to do it, uh, but um, I do think they need to be, uh, need to tread cautiously. Um, and then um, I think the successful ones, which have been successful in India, will, will take many of their models to Africa. Yeah. By the way, folks, we're going to open this to the floor. So if you have a question. Anika, wherever you are, let's get the mics out there and um, please ask the questions, okay? Don't, don't let me do all the work here, yeah? Because I get tired sometimes. So Seema, you worked in Africa. You did a lot of work, especially in Malawi, one of the most boring countries in Africa. <laughs> Anyway, so, so you did some work there. Would you, would you recommend Malawi to investors out here to do some social entrepreneurship? Would you recommend a country like that? Absolutely. And why? Because the scale of the challenge is so big that you need to have every, uh, every sort of stakeholder involved, be it the government, be it the private sector, be it the NGO. If you are at the cutting edge and you are looking for a challenge, that is the country to because the, you, may, you may take a huge risk, but the rewards are going to be huge and they're exhibiting to, to be there. I mean, it, is, it is not the world's... Um, it's not the fastest country in the world. It's not the most uh, set of country in the world. In fact, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. But just the scale of challenge that exists uh, gives you a sense of the potential that exists to actually address it. And if you went there and you did, good work as a social enterprise, I think it would be a, a fascinating thing in terms of the rewards that you get back for it. Yeah. Andreas, I'd hate to sound uh, stereotypical, but there's this, oh, this saying, is this Africa's time? Let me ask it this way. Is this Af India's time to get into Africa before the Chinese take everything that's out there? <laughs> well, the, the truth in Nairobi is, is most road construction you see, not only is it a Chinese contractor, it's Chinese laborers as well. Mm -hmm. And that frustrates me uh, for many reasons, but it should not be the case. There's tremendous opportunity for Indian companies to come. You know, one thing that I found frustrating two years ago, one of our clients, uh, as we were discussing with them, expanding tremendously quickly, and this is an ag manufacturer uh, processor, uh, they needed a, a large piece of equipment and they wanted to source it from India. They'd heard great prices, so on. They had absolutely no way to get in touch with an Indian company to provide it but for Google. And so they start Googling Indian company for this piece of equipment. They got a quotes list, and, and, they, and they went with one company that may, may as well have been fraudulent. Uh, I, I don't want that to be the case. I want better links between the two countries. And I've been very excited to be here and speaking with IntelliCap because I do think it takes initiative from both sides. I think it takes initiative from entities very close to entrepreneurs on the ground in Africa and those very close with Indian entrepreneurs to open up the gateway, to facilitate the connection. And, and I think it's absolutely high time. I, I don't think that, uh, that uh, as I'm getting surrounded by flies, I don't think, uh, I don't think this is a, a relationship which is going to be dominated by one country at all. I think uh, this is an opportunity for innovators across the world to come to Africa. And uh, I, you know, it's certainly been true of a number of players, for example, in telecommunications, uh, with Bati coming in through Airtel across several African countries. And I'm very excited to try and help facilitate that, get involved, try and get more Indian companies just have access to share the exciting entrepreneurs who are developing real businesses and represent real potential for growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oscar Agen, your biggest beef, if you will, is the fact that the traffic flowing between Africa and India is one way. It's mostly India lending its technology, lending its skill set right. to Africa. It's not coming this way. And you went to school here, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, Jeff, it's a totally different scenario. Uh, one thing that I keep, I, see, I keep asking myself the same question. Why is that so much technology traffic from India to Africa and not from Africa to India? 
Uh, but I think uh, the direction we've taken, the, the direction that IntelliCut has taken, where they could avail a platform or a bridge where Africans could also export their technology to India through franchising, through some transfer, or any model that would work, I think is just a good enough enabling environment uh, to see us cross over to India to set, uh, to set up shop. I hope they're going to welcome us here to build up franchises here in the future. And, yeah, good point. Anurag, let's face it. You were taking a big risk coming to Africa, I'm sure, and people were telling you, I'm sure Vinny was telling you, are you crazy? Are you going there? Are you crazy? Quite the opposite, actually. <laughs> He's been telling me, why are you not going there for the last three years? But anyways, I think uh, the other side, flip side of risk is opportunity. And uh, if I sort of, uh, you know, tick mark uh, the points that Sachin made earlier, are there, uh, you know, is there enough business and customers for us in Africa? Absolutely. Uh, is there uh, a need to customize and contextualize what, uh, what we will do there? Absolutely. And our thinking is that we will not be able to do there unless we build a local team out there. Mm. And thirdly, have we established some sort of a base and credibility in our home market? I do believe we've done that so far. So. Questions from the floor. Questions? Anybody? Don't be shy, okay? Just please. Seema, at the same time, while we're getting the questions. So what's the biggest stumbling block? What, what's, what's keeping us from strengthening that bridge, strengthening the ties. What is it? Well, it's complicated. Um, I think that traditionally, um, both India and African countries have competed for the same markets in the West. Uh, so there's very, there has been very little incentive actually to collaborate. Um, both sets uh, of regions have grown at different speeds. Uh, both sets of regions have had a very different growth and development journey. And this has made uh, things difficult. Uh, politically, the dialogue has not always been very strong. It is growing, but it's not always been very strong. And I think that uh, needs to be uh, looked at uh, quite quickly in the near future. Because Indian companies recognize that Africa is the next frontier in terms of um, resources, in terms of labor, in terms of markets, in terms of land. And uh, African, uh, African countries recognize that India has a lot of expertise and experience to share around development. Yeah. Uh, it's done it its own way in a lot of cases. It's done it without interference. And it's done it in a way that's more applicable to its setting, some of which actually uh, if you went to Bihar, it wouldn't be that different from rural parts of Bihar, wouldn't be that different from very poor parts of Africa. Mm. So there are lots of experience to be shared here and this collaboration needs to be strengthened. There are issues around uh, a political dialogue and building those economic land bridges and making the economics viable for it. I think it's happening slowly but steadily. Yeah, but Oscar, I, Agan, you were saying earlier on, I mean, the Arabs came to Africa, what, three, four hundred years ago and they stayed and intermarried and created a new language. The Indians came what, 120, 150 years ago. They stayed, but they stayed amongst themselves. They kept to themselves. Is that the difference as well? Is that? Absolutely. I think it, it contributes. It contributes to the gap. Because uh, rather than just coming in and looking at one another from a purely commercial perspective, let's break the barriers to go beyond the commercial sphere and go into the cultural sphere, where, where trade could be, going, could be moved into marriage or from either parties, so that there'd be a lot more, there could be a lot more integration from a, cultural, uh, from a cultural angle to strengthen the commercial uh, stand. I think that's what's been lacking. And you'll appreciate the fact that uh, the marriage that was there between the Arabs and the Bantus that gave birth to Swahili uh, would have done a lot better had the Indians married a lot more of the Africans to give birth to what I don't know. But I believe there would be a lot more traffic that would <coughs> generate, generate a lot of what I'd call uh, a bigger commercial... Uh, commercial uh, it's never too late for that to happen, Oscar. We can still do that, huh? We could, yeah. yeah. I mean. <laughs> Sachin, you're based in Nairobi. 
when you're in Nairobi, you, you could as well be in Mumbai, Delhi, any cosmopolitan city. I mean, there's people just like this all over Nairobi. Do you think we don't sell ourselves enough? Do we not uh, put ourselves out there enough as Africans? So uh, just to clarify, I'm, I'm based in Mumbai, actually. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, but okay, but you fly to Nairobi a lot. Yeah, pardon me, yeah, pardon me. Quite often. Mm, no, I, I'm not sure. So, uh, you, you know, I, I think Nairobi, you know, I, I travel there quite often. I love the city. Weather's much better than Mumbai. Great, uh, you know, great community. Uh, many more food options in Nairobi than you get in Mumbai, truthfully speaking. So I think it's, uh, I, I think it's a great city. Um, uh, however, I, you know, I used to work in Southeast Asia uh, before, uh, you know, joining Acumen. And if I con contrast sort of Southeast Asia and Africa, uh, I do think uh, Southeast Asia has, um, you know, uh, and just to be clear, Doctor, we, we haven't, you know, married heavily into the Southeast Asian economies either. Uh, but uh, I think um, uh, one thing has to do with how easy it is to do commerce. Um, and, you know, it, the, the Indians who've emigrated out of India, I think, have emigrated first for com commerce. Even the Indian communities that you see in East Africa uh, have really gone there, you know, to do business uh, sometimes three or four hundred years ago, uh, you know, when the railroads were being built and other things were happening. And I think just from a political uh, and regulatory point of view, a country, a country like Malaysia or a country like Thailand or even Vietnam, after it uh, you know, moved out of uh, you know, the very socialist nature that it had, Burma quite recently, have all been very, uh, very uh, forthcoming to provide foreign capital in general and Indian capital, I think, um, you know, a, a place to do business in. That started happening in Africa. And we, we do see that in certain countries. So I think Kenya is a clear country where it's quite easy to do business in. And we have a sort of Indian companies like, like Bharti or Tata's or Ashok Leyland, uh, you know, the manufacturers doing, uh, you know, doing business over there for many, many years. And that's spreading uh, to, to, you know, other areas, Nigeria being a classic example of, of, of that in Africa. So I think it's, it's really that which, you know, will progress this thing about Indian companies uh, you know, reaching out. South Africa has always been a country where Indians have, uh, you know, done a lot of business in. And I think it will be commerce-led, and then that integration, I imagine, uh, will become uh, easier. And Indians, I, I can assure you, will see the advantages in living in Nairobi over Mumbai. <laughs> good one, good one. If I could just add a yeah. little bit to that. I think it's also to do with uh, the fact that India itself was capital deficient for a very long time. So it's not just to, anything to do with Africa, the fact that uh, it's only very recently in the last 10, 15 years that the Indian corporates and who are going out and investing in other geographies. So, you know, the 100 years of history is really irrelevant because the capital was never there to go out and invest elsewhere. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of, just just yeah. to add to that, I mean, it is going to happen in reverse. Uh, when I see something like M-Pesa and I, how it's transformed Africa, um, and, uh, you know, many of our companies in India completely struggle with transaction systems. Uh, how do you collect money from low-income consumers? Um, and I see M-Pesa, for example, being used by all straters of society. I think that innovation is going to flow. The reason which is keeping it back today is still regulation, because the Indian financial sector is regulated in a way uh, where mobile transactions are very, very hard to do. I know companies in India are trying to make an attempt to solve that, uh, but it, it, it's you know really those factors which I think keep uh, sort of innovation and enterprises uh, apart. Uh, but it's really going to I think uh, come together from both directions, mind you. Yeah, and M-Pesa is that system of uh, money transaction through the mobile phone, which has taken off. I mean, it does more business in Kenya than Western Union does globally. Incredible. Wow. And imagine if, if you touch just 0.001% of this population here, you'd be cooking with gas, literally. <laughs> okay, questions from the floor. Yes, okay, good, okay. Where, where are the mics? Where are the, yeah. You got the mic? Go ahead, sir, go ahead. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Sachin, I'd like to say the Paranakan community on the west coast of Malaysia is a good example of Indians integrating with the locals. Yeah. Um, two, 300, 200 years old, Chinese, Malays, and Indians intermarrying. Anyway, that aside, <coughs> uh, I had a question for anyone on the panel. Do you think uh, the 
politicians need to lead uh, this collaboration between businesses in India and Africa. Because uh, I happened to visit uh, one of the African countries. The Chinese president visited almost every single country in Africa. He spent three days in Seychelles. I don't think the president of India knows where it is. <laughs> so, so um, I, I don't know if anybody has a comment on that. Good. Let's have another question, please. Sir, go ahead. You have a mic? Uh, I'm Jacob. I'm from Industry Foundation. And over the last couple of years, we've run workshops in uh, three or four African countries. Uh, uh, Zambia, uh, Mozambique, and uh, Swaziland. Um, one of the problems that we face is that as a foundation and as a social enterprise, we are pretty much in bootstrap now. And you know, jumping in and uh, replicating our model is one, is one thing. The other is to actually collaborate with an African entity and set up an African version of what we are doing. We don't want to go, back, go there and set up, let's say, a mother earth in, uh, in Africa. But you want to do the African equivalent of that. And those mechanisms are still not very clear. And I'm just wondering if there is a way by which there is some kind of a platform that's created, you know, that uh, has a blended capital model that can gradually build up uh, social enterprises, but on more of a co-creation and collaboration. Good question, Jacob. Okay, let's have one more over there. Come on. Take the mic over there, please. Stick the mic in your mouth. Uh, I am Prevan and I've been working in uh, healthcare, uh, rural healthcare to be specific. A question I have is uh, uh, I was talking to one of the healthcare providers in Kenya and they were saying, you know, the solution that you have a product would be really useful here. But uh, having heard so many stories where companies have just jumped into the African continent and uh, tried, having tried and failed, is there a way like uh, DFID, Acumen, IntelliCAP? can arrange for uh, small players like us to get uh, companies from Africa, mentors on board, you know, or someone who's heading a successful healthcare venture, can initially mentor us for six months or so and with their help we can tailor the solution for uh, one of the African countries, for example, Kenya, and then step in there. Uh, is, is there any work going on or already are you doing something? Great, okay, let's answer those three. Sachin. Leading from the front, Chinese president jumps on a plane, ends up in some country Indians have never heard of, like Seychelles. Leading from the front, should that, should the Indians be doing that? I, I think uh, the answer to that is quite obvious. Uh, it's a yes. Um, and um, I, I, I think generally, uh, you know, the, the government sometimes can be less proactive uh, than what it should be in forging you know, those ties uh, with the companies. We have actually a lot in common with many countries in Africa. Uh, we have diasporas over there. We have a common uh, colonial heritage uh, with many of those companies. It's quite easy, actually, sometimes to do that. The facilitators, like the government, would definitely help. Um, however, my experience, even in India, indicates, even in the social enterprise sector, I think, uh, that it's often private enterprise in India which has led these forays uh, rather than you know some external party in the government or uh, you know somebody else saying you know we will make it all smooth for you. Um, it, okay, should we put pressure on the government to do more? Definitely yes. Uh, but will I think private enterprise lead? Uh, I also uh, think that's likely to be the case in you know, India. Andreas, let me just follow up on that because. When Obama came to Africa last year, he came with like 300 top-end businessmen. You saw that, right? The top 100, they were in his plane and then others came after that. Wasn't that a show, of course, leading from the front and bringing your best, your, your A team? Absolutely, and I couldn't agree more with such. I, I, you know, we really, that the business communities have to lead. Uh, they have to show by example what the innovations are. I've been several times at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi where they've invited uh, delegations of U.S. businesses to actually speak with Kenyan enterprises. I, I don't know if that's been the case with India, but I very much hope that uh, that, that sort of approach can be organized because, again, very, very valuable to put business minds together.
Yeah. There's 800 million people voting right now in India, right? What, new Prime Minister or something, yeah? So maybe some guy might... Like, yeah, right. Which would be its instrument of translating sort of big ideas into actual practice is smaller than that in New Zealand. For a country this size, our foreign service representation is really, really small. So there are, there are challenges there that we need to think about. Um, in terms of uh, you know, political dialogue, you don't just need to think about it in terms of India to country X, India to country Y, but I think also need to think about wider terms. So you need to think about uh, other platforms in which uh, uh, you know, India has a conversation, a political conversation with other countries. So it can be the WTO, it can be the G20, it can be the G77. So there are various platforms available. It's just sort of thinking through uh, more strategically how we can employ this. Because uh, let's face it, you know, there is not really that much incentive for the Indian government to invest in its foreign service force. Uh, given that all the charge has been led by the private sector and it's going to continue to do so. And Africa is not really a priority, is it? I don't know whether it's a priority or not. I'm sure it is in terms of access to resources and land and labor as um, global value chains develop. Yeah, but but um, yeah. the private sector is always led and I think that's still going to be the case. I think what uh, political dialogue needs to do is facilitate this process rather than you know, take lead because that's, I don't think that's where it's, uh, it's uh, expertise, not, not expertise, but it's, it's comparative advantage lies. So I think facilitation is a, is a bigger role they need to play than actually go and make a big show when they may not be able to otherwise deliver on the promises that they make simply because they're constrained by the resources that they have. Okay, good points. I'd, I'd, like, Oscar, to add, yeah? I'd like to add something. I mean, Jeff, I think we as Africans should stop looking at other countries with a begging bowl, where we have the resources, yes, everybody knows Africa has enormous resources, but hardly do we Africans venture out to go and scout for investment opportunities in other continents. Uh, I would take like an example, a campus that you just mentioned. I believe it comes in here, I mean, it will turn in lots and lots and lots of uh, rupees to move from one person to the other. Uh, but that is an opportunity that has not been taken, I mean, an initiative that has not been taken from the African side. And even for the banking, we have Bank of Baroda, we have Bank of India. I don't see equity, I don't see KCB on this continent, yet we've got a lot of Kenyans, a lot of Tanzanians on the Indian continent. So I think that in as much as we are looking at uh, our counterparts in India, to be holding a high hand, to be high-handed in terms of the technology. I think we've also not equally reciprocated on our side to play game with them in yeah. terms of commerce. Hmm. Kind of makes you want to think, huh? Jacob's question, the one about the Africa version. They come here, they, they, they're in bootstrap mode. They try to get an Africa version, not an Indian version. An Africa version doesn't quite work. The mechanism is not quite clear. Can there be one? I think so. Uh, I think uh, there are various modes in which uh, an Indian enterprise looking to expand into Africa can get into Africa. In fact, uh, you know, following up our work uh, with Sankalp Africa, what we are trying to do is to work on those models. What are those models of replication? What is working here? What are the things that will make things work in the context of a particular country in Africa? Whether you should go and do it alone, do it by yourself or in a JV mode or in a franchise mode. Uh, or just, you know, uh, uh, a business relationship mode, uh, whether you just uh, transfer knowledge or you go and execute by yourself. So I think there are various ways of doing it uh, and, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be ready to be able to do that. Uh, the point that Sachin made about being strong, uh, having a strong uh, <coughs> product offering, uh, value proposition to take there is ex extremely important and then getting the right partnerships in place is going to be important. Mm. And that, that leads to the third question, Sachin, maybe you can answer that and that's the, 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 the trial and failure. There's going to be lots of failures before you succeed, right? I mean, there's no way you're going to go in there 
and it's going to be a magic wand, a magic solution. There is no quick fix. It's not going to work the first time. You just have to be patient, I guess. Sure, and <clears throat> I think uh, you know the trying and failing happens in India too. Uh, it's not specific to moving your uh, you know enterprise to Africa. I mean, entrepreneurs in India will try and succeed and take long to get the model right. Um, however, I think the trying and succeeding, there are some things which entrepreneurs should think about, uh, you know, when they are uh, trying to make that transition or that addition to their, uh, to their geographical footprint. Uh, the first of them, it's a little bit more difficult for services than for products, is to try exports. You know, set up a distributor, export some solar lanterns uh, to Africa and see how they get adopted by the market over there. Obviously, for services, that's, quite, that's a more difficult thing to do. Uh, we've got a solar company which did exactly that for about three or four years in Africa, found their feet, uh, knew how they had to change their product a little bit for the African market, and has last year in 2013 then actually set up a subsidiary in Kenya, uh, which, is, uh, you know, which is partly funded and run by a Kenyan gentleman to then you know, start manufacturing and marketing the products over there. Uh, Africa has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's now the hotbed actually in a sense of incubation. So lots of incubators, lots of young people really interested in trying their hand at a proven business model, but running it, uh, you know, in their local country. So uh, th th there's a lot of people from, I think, the Western world who are coming back to uh, countries like Kenya and Nigeria. There are also people who would love to, uh, you know, who would love to tap into expertise which is moving. Um, and lastly, I think there, there's quite a bit of capital available uh, in Africa for new social enterprises. Uh, you know, if you have a good idea, come and talk to Acumen in Africa, and you know, we can definitely take a look at the business model. <laughs> good plug there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> more questions. A couple more questions, if we will. But Seema, at the same time, you, you saw the, the, the fear. People like Jacob and that gentleman back there who were saying, you know, uh, it's difficult doing business in Africa. It, the Af you know, what, what's good for the goose may not necessarily be good for the gander. I mean, they are legitimate concerns here, aren't they? Uh, certainly they are. And I think one of the big gaps, and this is not just in the case of Africa I, or India-Africa collaboration, I think even in the social impact space in India, learning's evolving. And the evidence on what works, what doesn't work, under what conditions, what is a sufficient condition, what is a necessary condition, is not always clear. So things that have worked in big urban um, settings in India are not easily replicable in another part of India. So the challenges in that sense are uh, the same. And I agree with the, the gentleman who asked the question about, uh, you know, supporting mentorship and these sorts of things. Because I, I sort of feel over the two days after having heard uh, or lots of people on the panels, is that finance is not necessarily always the issue. It is, not, it is an issue, but it's perhaps not binding. It's, it's that, you know, it's the softer skills around how do you transfer the technical skills, how do you understand what it means to build your business, what it means to connect with customers, all the sorts of things that Sachin referred to earlier. And that, that's where... Uh, Agencies like DFID are playing a big role in documenting this kind of evidence on pushing the boundaries um, to make uh, investors, entrepreneurs, and all other social players involved in this sector to think harder about, well, what are the results that we expect on the ecosystem? And what are the results that we expect in, in the case of individual investments and enterprises? And how far can we push this? And what is required to push this? So documenting this kind of work will certainly help, is my um, um, first um, um, plea. And uh, DFID is working quite hard at it. We do it through all our programs. Invent will pick up on that as well. Um, and the other is just exploring new forms of collaboration. So yesterday, we uh, launched um, a startup wave, the new incubation service with IntelliCap that DFID and GIZ are working. And immediately, I could see the connections for Millennium Alliance, where you're thinking, why just restrict it to the Indian market? Where, you know, it's going to provide all this support, uh, incubation support for people who are pitching new ideas to people like Sachin and Andreas. Why not just, you know, have a tutorial that's open to the rest of the world who can tap into this kind of a support service um, and uh, use it 
uh, to the benefit. And I think we just need to be really creative because money is not the problem. Uh, pushing boundaries and having grand visions and how to make them real, those are the big challenges, I think. And we just have to be creative about it. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I'll take one more question from the floor, sir. You go, go ahead. Anil Sinha from, from IFC, as you know, we, uh, a global organization has investments and advisory services in South Asia as well as in Africa. Just a plug for Africa. Our portfolio in Africa is as large on an annual basis as our portfolio in South Asia and equally profitable. We do $2 billion a year in Africa and we make money out of it and we lend directly to the private sector. So just like there's a maturing of India Inc., there's a maturing in Africa, Inc. And the suggestion and the question is, in this entire ecosystem, what's the plan to bring the African enterprises that are successful into this play, like they have been in India, an important player for social development? Um, and secondly, of course, as we look at financing, we often find that working capital is a big issue. Both these gentlemen provide equity, uh, but working capital is, a, is, is an issue. And we've been working with the Exim Bank of India to provide working capital for enterprises that go across and financing local banks to finance these, these ventures. Um, I think the same scheme could be looked at for social enterprises too. Maybe there could be a special uh, line for that because the, the requirements are different. Um, but for this bridge to work, there has to be traffic both ways. It's not a slide. And unless we have that bridge, and we need successful African entrepreneurs coming across, and, and, and what could be a special focus for that would be very interesting. In Africa, we saw some companies that were interested in coming across to India, some of them financed by IFC. Bridge, for example, right. the education company that's done brilliant work in Africa wants to come out to India. And my suggestion is to the team, a special focus on African enterprises coming out to Africa, showcase them. We're working with IntelliCap, we're bringing out some of these case studies, but the bridge must flow both ways. And then only is it a bridge. You can call me anytime you want me to do any showcasing for you, okay? <laughs> anytime. <laughs> All right, folks, I think we're gonna wrap this up right now because I think uh, someone on the clock is telling me we don't have too much time, but we're gonna do this. We're gonna give you all two minutes each to wrap up. Andreas Zeller, starting with you, moving forward. You got two minutes. I think, you know, I'll probably take less than that. I, I think it's exciting that we've all basically agreed to the same ideas. Uh, we've all agreed there needs to be a, a bridge with two-way traffic flow, to, to extend that metaphor. We need to see more um, missions of, of different business leaders both ways, between both countries. But also, many of our org organizations here are global. Uh, and I would really encourage, uh, you know, all of us to have communication. We're certainly very open. I think we're very encouraged to speak with many of you and follow up in terms of ways of, of bringing you across and then sending you our entrepreneurs. I've, I've had discussions with many private equity funds in India and venture capital funds that already want to put us in touch with their portfolio companies and we'll do the same with businesses that we've worked with. So I'm very excited just practically speaking to move forward with those initiatives and, and work with many of you uh, here today to actually explore those initiatives and hopefully by next uh, Sankalp in Nairobi we'll have updates to report. Excellent, all right. Sachin Rudra. So um, I think just two points to make. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I find the social enterprise sector so much more collaborative uh, than the you know, pure private sector which I used to work in earlier. And um, I think that collaboration works well within the country, uh, India, which I've seen this far. And I'm actually quite hopeful that it can work across borders uh, in an equally collaborative way. Um, and, um, you know, and, you know, funds like Acumen, which have a feet or um, in, in all parts of the world, could actually and should actually play a greater role in doing that. One of the things that we are doing um, is, um, uh, you know, is trying to look at business models which are successful uh, in Acumen worldwide, and then trying to see which of them could actually be taken to, you know, another country, which would have a similar problem or, you know, could use that same solution. And that work will take a little bit of time, but I think for us personally, as we look for pipeline and we look to invest more money uh, behind social enterprises, it could actually throw up four to five models which could actually you know, travel quite well. Um, and, um, and, and lastly, you know, um, I think it just helps to talk. Uh, so some of my greatest learnings are when I go to the Nairobi office or I go to the Accra office and we yap, yap, yap in the conference room, 
And then I'm like, hey, there's this great business model in healthcare, which you know, somebody should start in India. Um, and uh, you know, that can almost, uh, almost become another way to just make sure that ideas get transferred. Uh, not all Indian entrepreneurs take up the ideas I give them, but I'm hoping uh, you know, that there'll be more of that. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'll do this in 30 seconds. <laughs> Dr. Seema Bhatia Pataki, you said you give me 30 seconds? Yeah. Give me 30 seconds. Go global, learn from each other, and just innovate. Uh, less than 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, well, I'm overachieving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Seema. But this is what I, I've learned from a couple of years of the work that I've been doing around partnerships, not just on innovation, but on a whole range of things around uh, policy, research, uh, all sorts of things. But these are fundamentally the issues that keep coming up for me. So these are the three things that are very important. Give it to us again. Go local. Um, collaborate and innovate. Excellent. Dr. Roscoe Agen, you're next, going forward. I think going forward uh, is that uh, the, the more sophisticated technological space in India uh, should be replicated a lot more in Africa and in Telecom. Uh, organizations like Intelica should set a lot more bridges to link the two continents to drive technology transfer, because the fact is that Indian technology is what is affordable to we Africans. And if there is a bridge that will enable us to link, then I think we could ride, we could stride on that bridge to, to grow us. And the telecap is the bridge. Absolutely. Anurag Agarwal, you get the last word in the panel. Okay, so that's a lot of uh, pressure on us. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, you know, we are relatively new to Africa, so you know, I won't claim to be the expert on what needs to be done here. But just a few uh, few points based on what we've learned so far uh, in India and what we've seen in Africa. I think the piecemeal approach won't work. You know, just putting some capital there or just uh, trying to replicate a single business model there won't work. So it does need a lot of work, it will need time uh, to build out that whole ecosystem. That ecosystem is not developed in India itself. So, so there is a scope for a lot of learning across, across the two continents uh, <coughs> of what is working in one place. There's obviously need for contextualizing it, but uh, I think there's just a lot of information asymmetry out there. And if there is, you know, the role that organizations like IntelliCap can play is to be that bridge in, uh, you know, create, in, uh, filling some of the gaps in that information asymmetry. And uh, I think uh, the other big thing uh, that is important is that uh, what is our propensity to take risks? I think uh, if we keep dying wondering, <laughs> uh, nothing will ever move. So yeah. we have to actually go and do some, do some work and take action and be prepared to fail. And successes will come out of those failures. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd like to thank all my guests, starting with Dr. Oscar Agan. Uh, Anurag Agawal, Dr. Seema Bhatia Pantaki, Andreas Zeller, and Sachin Tendulkar. <laughs> Please give them a round of applause for their input. I get to have the last, last word. I don't know if you guys have watched this movie, ever heard of it. My, one of my all-time favorite films is one called Field of Dreams, starring Kevin Costner. It's about 20-something years old. And there's a line that keeps coming back in that film, keeps coming back and forth. Check it out one time. And the line is, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. We build these relationships. We build the bridges that we're talking about. We build the collaboration. They will come. And it has started. So we're on the right track. Thank you very much for staying, ladies and gentlemen. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank Back you, you Jeff. Mike.